Hi and welcome to our Oasis Global Gathering. I'm Nathan Jones and I'm one of the two ministers of Oasis Church Waterloo. It's great to have you with us this morning. Today we're carrying on our series called Building Something Better. I'm sure that over the years many of us have had questions about what we believe and why we believe it. Maybe some of us have spent time in churches where we didn't feel like it was okay to doubt what the preacher was saying, even if it didn't seem to sit quite right with us. At Oasis, we believe that our faith is to be discussed, debated, and through this discussion and debate, we eventually end up with something stronger. So that's what this series is all about, looking again at what we've been told about Christianity and asking, is this really what I believe? Or is there a different story? This week, Rob Tricky, who's part of the leadership team at Oasis Church Bath, is exploring our second question. Why is the God of the Bible so violent? Before that, though, we're going to hear from Hannah Miller. Hannah started working for Oasis recently, running our work in Salford at Oasis Hub Media City UK. And earlier in the week, I caught up with her to talk about how it's gone so far. So Hannah, tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing before this. Okay, so I'm Hannah Miller. I started as the hub leader at Oasis uh, Media City UK in May this year. So right in the middle of lockdown, which was an interesting time to start in this role, but also a time where there was such great need within the community of Salford. So for those that don't know, Media City UK is uh, based in Salford. Um, that's where we are. Uh, before I started this role, I worked at Christian Aid. Um, I've worked at Christian Aid for over 12 years, um, mainly in events and community fundraising. Um, so I'm bringing a lot more of that sort of fundraising background um, to the role, which will hopefully be really beneficial to the hub. Um, so that's sort of my work experience, um, church experience. I've grown up um, as a Catholic, gone attended Catholic church. Um, my whole life so it's a very strange time at the moment um, not being able to attend that because I've got two young children and um, which they aren't able to attend so and that's why at the moment we're not going as a family so it's very strange on a Sunday morning not uh, not being there uh, but yeah that's a little bit about me. Yeah I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening to this who can identify with uh, where, yeah with not being able to uh, go to church on a Sunday and how strange that is. Tell us a bit more about Oasis Hub Media City UK then what do you do? Um, yes, yeah, so we are, we're part of an academy building, um, so we're really fortunate that we're actually based within an academy, so we've got really good strong links there with um, Oasis Academy Media City. Um, as I say, we are based in Salford, um, and although Media City is, in the media it's always portrayed as um, quite affluent and a brilliant place to live and a fantastic, um, really fantastic prospects, and there are, but there's also complete other side to Salford where there is a lot of poverty and a lot of the students from the academy and the families and communities around us um, are, are way above the national average um, for those poverty lines so there is a lot of need um, but there's also it's a real fantastic sort of Salfordian and Mancunian like community spirit and, and the personalities uh, it's it's a great place um, to be um, the hub itself has been active for um, a couple of years. I think it was 2018 that it, that we opened. Um, during the COVID pandemic, we've done a lot around like food delivery and that food poverty that has been a real concern for for a lot of our academy families in particular. And we also held some summer sessions. We had to do a lot of it virtual because we went back into um, a local lockdown. Um, but we had lots of activities for our young people, but also tried to do some um, family sessions. So. We usually have um, like a parents and tots group called Play Space on a Thursday morning. So we took that virtual. Um, we used some links that we had over at CBeebies um, at, on Media City um, itself, so not the Oasis Media City. Um, we used our links there. We had some story time sessions, people reading stories, um, and then we just sort of let the parents have a bit of have a bit of a chat together and sort of socialise and try and break down that isolation that we've cut. That's obviously happened over the last few months or so um, then the church side of things has been a bit quiet again because we've not had um, 
we haven't had a pastoral lead in we've not had um you know we've not had a hub leader so we had no church leader so yeah it's all been a little bit quiet really so we're kind of using this as to try and sort of like the rebirth of oasis media city um and we are looking to recruit um, a new church leader which will be fantastic um for us here Tell us a bit more about that um, potential job at the church. What's the uh, what's the aim of this developing church community? So the church at Media City um, is it's a mixture of the Oasis Church and also URC because this was the old URC um, site for Media for Salford and Media City. So it's uh, we're, we're working with the URC to recruit a um, like special categories minister and um, that will really help with sort of again chaplaincy within the academy uh, but then also developing more of a community church so to meet the needs of the of the community and to really assess what those needs are so it, it might not necessarily be a sunday morning congregational type church it might be more community activities so previously we've had like a, a church cafe um things sort of like thursday evening wednesday evening that sort of thing so it's perhaps not the traditional type of church but what we're going to do is when we do get that church leader in position we're going to work with the community to see what those needs are and actually what they want rather than us coming in and saying this is what we're going to do so that's kind of our plan we're we're it's early doors baby steps for it but uh yeah we're we're in the process of of recruiting a urc minister for for the area Right. Sounds fantastic. I think probably what you've already realised about Oasis is that trying to do something new and responding to the needs of the community rather than doing something traditional sounds exactly what we uh, try to get at every day. Yeah. Um, thanks, Hannah, for your time. Um, if anybody wants to know any more about the work of Oasis Hub Media City UK, the URL is going to pop up on the screen in a second. Thanks, Hannah. We'll speak to you again Thank soon. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. If you'd like to find out more about the plans for Oasis Church Media City UK as they emerge, you can get in touch with Hannah at the address on the screen. It's almost time for Rob to speak to us, but before he does, here are today's Bible readings. Rob's gone for two readings, some verses from the New Testament, from John chapter 1, and from the Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 53. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. When I was a kid, my favourite TV show was The Virginian, which was all about life on a cattle ranch somewhere in the Wild West. Something about the setting as well as the stories just captured my imagination and still does to some extent. I love watching the films too. There are the classic tales of good against evil, one man against insurmountable odds. Stories like High Noon, Shane, The Man from Laramie. And then, of course, there are the cowboy and Indian films. Perhaps one of the most iconic of all Westerns is The Searchers, where John Wayne plays a cavalry officer searching for his daughter who's been captured by an Indian tribe. I love this stuff. And of course, I was always rooting for the cowboys against the Indians. I had no sense of the troubling reality behind them. The history of genocide and, and theft of ancestral lands. I also grew up on a diet of Bible stories, equally gripping tales of heroism and valour. Some of these were immortalised in song. 
Does anyone remember Dare to Be a Daniel? I loved it, and I listened intently to the stories of Noah building his boat, of the Israelites fleeing Egypt and the destruction of Pharaoh's army, of the conquest of Jericho. I love these stories, cheering on Noah, Moses and Joshua. I had no sense of the troubling reality behind them, the history of genocide, slavery and forced expulsions. And looking back, I'm not sure this was just down to the naivety of youth. I'm not sure many of the adults around me thought of the stories in that way either. Whether or not that's true, these are issues that can no longer be ignored. The treatment of Native Americans is an injustice which cries out for restitution. And the stories of the conquest of Canaan still have ramifications to this day. But quite apart from the politics and the human suffering that results from it, these ancient tales from the Bible raise a huge theological question. Who is the God behind it all? The God who decides to destroy virtually all living things who sends the angel of death through Egypt and wipes out Pharaoh's army, who commands the destruction of cities and the slaughter of their inhabitants. Who is this God who sanctions all this destruction? Why is the God of the Bible so violent? We may be tempted to ignore these questions, to put these passages to one side, along with a lot of other Old Testament stuff which just doesn't seem relevant. But if we decide which bits of the Bible we're going to engage with and which we're just going to ignore, then the Bible loses its power to challenge and transform. It just ends up reinforcing and validating what we already believe. So when we, side, when we sideline the difficult stuff, we sell ourselves short. We should also be aware that for many outside of the church, this is a huge obstacle to faith. Back in 2015, Stephen Fry caused a bit of a stir in an interview on Irish television when he described the God of the Bible as an evil, capricious, monstrous maniac. The language is typically extreme, but the sentiment isn't. And as our culture increasingly confronts some of the more unsavoury aspects of its history, these stories from the Bible and therefore this God seem to have less and less relevance or appeal. So we have to grapple with these issues at some level for our own sake and in order to be able to offer something credible to the world. But how do we do this? It seems to me that the key to this lies in our understanding of the Bible. If we view the, view the Bible as a kind of theological textbook or reference book, which we can dip into at any point, then these stories will be troublesome. Or we might think of it as being like a jigsaw puzzle box, containing all the pieces we need for our picture of God, in which case every piece has to fit somewhere, and the result can end up looking grotesque. An old approach, which is still popular, is to set the Old Testament against the New Testament, the vengeful God of the Old against the merciful God of the New which sounds attractive, but it creates more problems than it solves. Because how do we then reconcile these two versions of God? Are they the same being? And although the distinction makes superficial sense, in reality, these strands are interwoven throughout the Bible. There is grace and love in the opening chapters of Genesis. And the book of Revelation contains some of the most vivid descriptions of judgment in the whole Bible. Steve suggested last week that we think of the Bible as a library of diverse texts written and compiled over centuries. Or in a similar vein, we might think of the Bible as a collection of stories, a kind of anthology. These pictures are pointing us in the right direction, but there are still difficulties. Does each text or story have equal value? If not, how do we decide which to read? We're back to the problem of pick and mix theology. It seems to me that the most helpful way to view the Bible is to see it as a single story. The story of God's dealings with his people over hundreds of years. It's often described as a love story. But it's also a thriller or a mystery 
where more is revealed as the story unfolds and where it turns out that some events earlier in the tale have a different or deeper meaning than we first thought. Reading the Bible in this way enables us to engage with those passages which are difficult to read, while at the same time understanding where they fit within the time frame of the overall narrative. We get a sense of flow, of something unfolding, rather than being static or flat. Reading in this way, we can take seriously the historical and social context, recognising that these are not timeless tales, but they are rooted in a time and place, even where the stories themselves are more like parables than journalistic reporting. The story of the Bible really begins in Genesis 12, where God calls Abraham and promises him that through his descendants, they would become a great nation established in their own land and through whom blessing would come to the world. The story of the Bible is the outworking and sometimes the recasting of these promises beyond mere nationalism to the point where the whole earth becomes the dwelling place of God and his people. So this was never meant to be just about Israel. This is the narrative context for the stories of the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan. In terms of social context, both in Egypt and among the tribes of Canaan, there is evidence of barbarity, including child sacrifice. By contrast, the social and religious codes given to Israel were very enlightened. These laws reflect a God of justice and order, who will honour his covenant with his people, who therefore have no need to live in fear a God unlike the capricious, insatiable gods of Canaan. These insights don't solve all the problems, but they do help us to see where these difficult passages fit. And so a good story will unfold for us as we read, revealing new elements, new twists and turns, maybe a few shocks and surprises along the way. Where we end up may be quite different from where we started. And in the telling of a story, we will also discover more about the characters within it. What is their story, their motivation? What are their hopes and dreams and fears? And this is no less true of the Bible. The character and nature of God is revealed more fully as the story moves forward. And perhaps the most important result of reading the Bible as a single complex narrative is that it enables us to see that Jesus is the focal point of the whole thing, as Steve was reminding us last week. The Gospels provide that key reveal, that ah, I see moment, which reshapes our understanding of what's gone before and sets the course for the rest of the story. Once we've read the stories of Jesus, we can go back to the earlier chapters and reread them in this light. And it is in Jesus that we see most fully who God is. Once we understand that Jesus is the word made flesh, the ultimate revelation of God, the lens through which we view the whole Bible, then we have a way of seeing where the rest of the Bible fits within the overall story. In terms of our question this morning, through Jesus we see that God's ultimate purpose is peace and reconciliation, love for enemies, and an open invitation to all peoples to enter his kingdom. It may seem contradictory, but this is the goal towards which those earlier events were leading. This is the big picture, the grand story. Reading the Bible in this way, we see that God works in and through the mess of our human existence, within cultures, in the midst of human history. Throughout history, and not just in the person of Jesus, the work of God is often incarnate, clothed in human flesh, in human culture, human history. We can't separate these things out. And most profoundly of all, with Jesus at the centre of our understanding, we see that God is not the perpetrator of violence and hatred, but the one who suffers as a victim a God who engages with the violence of a broken world in order to create something new. Of course, none of this means that all the problems are solved. 
Just like all those who have gone before us, including the biblical writers, we see through a glass darkly. We know in part. We often work with fragments and glimpses. But we can at least grapple honestly with the Bible and help others to do the same. We invite you to pray with us as we reflect on the world around us and what it means to build something better. We consider the moments we see glimpses of God, feel the presence of God's spirit, know God's peace and fullness of life. And we also recognise the times we feel an absence of God in the chaos, the challenge, the struggle, the mundane. Our prayer is that in those moments, our most vulnerable and desperate, we can cling to the hope of a God of love, that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to one another, to our neighbour, to the stranger. Jesus, who sought out the broken, the outcast, the uneducated, the poor, the sick, the challenged, the lonely. God, challenge us to start with ourselves, that we may reflect on our own actions, thoughts and words, and practice habits that shape us to be more Christ-like. May we take small steps in this big narrative to see change for a better world. Give us humility, O oh God, to build something better. We pray for our young people who are transitioning into a new normal and struggling with restriction, change, isolation and confusion. We pray for our school staff, youth workers, as we adapt to guide them. We pray for our parents who support, provide care for their families. In this time of uncertainty, may our young people continue to know their potential and find positivity in a new start to the school year. Give us resilience, O oh God, to build something better. We pray for those experiencing poor health, for whom each day can be a struggle, physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. Help us to care generously for those around us. Give us compassion, O oh God, to build something better. Father, we ask you for the courage to be able to break down barriers and step out of our comfort zone as we seek to build something better. Give us the eyes to see what it is you want us to see. Give us courage, O oh God, to build something better. We pray for having the opportunity and ability to bring positive changes into our workplaces, homes and communities. Help us to be kind to ourselves and others as we challenge prejudice, learn empathy and have courage to stand for equality. Give us vision, O oh God, to build something better. Father, Mother God, we ask you for compassion to act boldly as global citizens, reaching out in love to one another. Give us hope, O oh God, to build something better. Our Father in heaven, so much uncertainty has come with the pandemic. We are confused, fearful and filled with anxiety. We're having to limit interactions with our loved ones in order to stay safe. The students are back in schools and most people at work still were questioning the safety of the whole situation. But Psalm 23 assures us that we have a shepherd in you, God, and in that we feel secure and feel protected. Thank you, Lord, for your eyes on a sparrow watching over us at all times. I pray for safety and protection, provision for those who are suffering due to the loss of financial um, security as employers are cutting off staff. Father God, please strengthen our physical and emotional health, also our spirituality to enable us to enjoy it all. I pray for the leaders of the United Kingdom and the world when they're making decisions on how to navigate life going forward. 
Father, we are made in your image and we are very precious to you. Please remind them that whilst we appreciate it's difficult to know what to do, our safety and health should be considered above other world economy issues. Strengthen them, Father, and help them to be open to suggestions from other pro professionals for the good of humanity. Lord, please also help us to be calm and patient with the process, not to fuss and ignore all the rules in place for our own safety. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you because we know that those who trust and have hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Father God, it is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we rush and race through this precious life, we pray that today each one of us hears your invitation to come and rest a while. Fill us with your spirit to find restoration within ourselves to ignite our faith and renew our hope. Lead us, O oh God, to build something better. Amen. Thanks, Rob. After Steve's talk last week, we've now had two weeks of looking at the Bible in a different way. And I'm aware that what Rob and Steve have said might have thrown up some questions for us. So before we rush on past this, we're going to pause for a minute and think through our responses to some questions. So let's stop and think about what it means to look again at the Bible. What new thing do I need to learn? What challenges might this bring up for me? And finally, despite the fact that, as we've discussed, the Bible was written in many places by many people over many years, one of the constants throughout the writings is that the people studied the scriptures in community. They talked about what they'd read, what they'd heard read to them, and they asked, what does this mean together? I wonder if in our modern Western culture, we've lost a bit of that. So as we end today, I'd like to encourage us to answer one final question. Who is there in my life that I can trust? Who I can have these discussions with? Who I can share my questions with? Who I can share this journey with? That's almost it for this week. Before I leave you, I wanted to quickly flag up two online conferences that Oasis are running over the next couple of months. Firstly, Creating Sanctuary, which aims to help church leaders and others to build healthier and safer churches for all. As you can see on the screen, that's 10 a.m. till 1 p.m. on Saturday the 17th of October. And then on Saturday the 7th of November, it's Break the Cycle, our project aiming to ensure racial equality in education leadership. Both of those will be well worth a few hours of your Saturday morning. If you'd like to register for either of them, go to eventbrite.co.uk and search Creating Sanctuary or Break the Cycle. We're going to end this morning with a song called Build Our Lives. Thanks for being with us. See you next week and God bless you.
In your love to Lord. 